Man, it's great to see you guys today. Um, just good to see some smiling faces. Glad you guys are here. My name is Will, and uh, I have the great uh, honor and privilege of serving as a pastor here at Calvary. And I want us to take a moment uh, to join with Christians all over the world. Um, today, on uh, Sundays all over the world, Christians gather in every tribe, tongue, nation, and language to worship Jesus. And one of the things that binds us together is that people in every culture are praying the same prayer. And that's the prayer that Jesus told us to pray, and it's the Lord's Prayer. And so, would you join with Christians all over as we pray the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Amen. Well, I remember one night, late, one of those late nights in college. I was sitting on the front porch with uh, one of my fraternity brothers, and, uh, one, uh, and, and one of our fraternity brothers that week had just been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And so on our minds was all these questions about life and death and heaven and hell and religion and what's next and all sorts of questions were going through our very young, you know, 20-year-old brains dealing with this suffering like this for, for many of us the first time. And so we're sitting on the front porch of the fraternity house and my buddy, he's asking me all kinds of questions. He knew I was a Christian and so he was asking me questions about my faith. He was asking me questions about Christianity. And after I shared a little bit with him, he said, you know, He said, I don't think God could forgive me for all that I've done. And I said, well, of course he could, and he will. And and I explained to him, uh, you you know, uh, what Christians believe. And he says, well, you don't understand. He said, if there there is a heaven, if, if there is a heaven, he said, there's no way God would let me in. And I said, well, man, I said, you know, in the Christian understanding of things, I said, we don't, it's not that we believe heaven is a place where all the good people go. I was like, we, that, that's not what Christians historically have believed. Heaven is not <clears throat> the place where all the people who followed the rules end up. Uh, I said, heaven is the place in the presence of God where people who realize they were never worthy or good enough to enter into God's presence on their own, but they trusted in the work of Jesus, and that's how they're there. I said, it's Jesus who who gets us into the presence of his Father, not our what we do or what we don't do. And he looked at me kind of puzzled, and so I explained with a story. I told him the story of the thief on the cross who was hanging next to Jesus, and he was a convicted criminal. He was sentenced to death, um, and according to the law, he deserved that execution. I told my friend, I said, here was this, this criminal, and he turns to Jesus in his final moment, his final moment, a life of who knows what. And in the final moment, he turns to Jesus. He says, Jesus, do you think you could remember me? Do you think you could remember me when you enter into your kingdom? And Jesus looks over at him with blood-soaked eyes and says to him, truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Convicted criminal, Life of crime, evil, regret, shame, guilt, all the rest of it. Trust in Jesus in his final breaths. Closes his eyes on this earth and opens them in the kingdom of heaven for all of eternity. And my friend says, wow, you know, that's great that God can forgive all that I've done. He said, you know, maybe I believe that God could forgive me for all the things I've done in my past. He said, but I know that, man, if I become a Christian, I'm just going to keep doing the same things. And he said, I I know myself, and I just don't know if God could keep forgiving me because I'll keep messing up. And I said, well, man, I said, again, in the Christian understanding of things, we believe that God's forgiveness is unlimited. You can never out God's grace. I told him the story of Peter. I was like, here's Peter, who was like, like Peter or Jesus is like right hand man. And his life is just a story of like up, down, in, out, failure, you know, and it's just, and Jesus continues welcoming him in. I said, I told my friend, I said, you cannot out God's love for you. And you cannot 
sinned so many times that he won't forgive. And he looked at me, I'll never forget it. And he's a Christian now, so we can laugh at this. But he said, with a look in his eyes, he looked at me with like a twinkle in his eyes, almost like he had discovered a loophole. He says, so you're telling me I can become a Christian today and still keep doing whatever I want. God will keep forgiving me and I still get to go to heaven. Now, I was 19, 20 years old, barely knew, you know, anything about the Bible. (laughs) What do you say in that moment? How would you answer that question? See, we've been studying the book of... uh, well, and, and this is the question I want us to consider today. If we're saved by God's grace and not by our good deeds, not by our good efforts, not by our good intentions, if there's nothing that we could do that can make God love us more, and if there's nothing we could do that can make God love us less, then here's the question. Then what exactly are the commands in the Bible for anyway? Can we just keep doing whatever we want and rely on God's forgiveness? Why do we even obey the law of God if we're not saved by being obedient to them? What are the commands of Jesus for? See, we've been studying the book of Galatians for several weeks now. And this book, this letter was written by a guy named the Apostle Paul. And many of the religious people in his day um, were very frustrated with Paul. Because he was preaching this message of we are saved by Jesus plus nothing else. You are, you are welcomed into the presence of God. You're forgiven of your sins. You're accepted by God. You're given an eternity with God, not because of what you do or don't do or say or don't say or think or don't think. You are accepted by God purely on the basis of what Jesus has done for you. It is faith in Jesus plus nothing else, and that's how you are accepted by God. And Paul was preaching this message all over the world, and these religious leaders were like, Paul... You've got to be careful. You've got to be careful talking like that. If you preach that message, people will think they can live however they want. And I'm pretty sure that Paul's opponents probably would have said the same thing to me on the front porch of my fraternity house that day as well. See, Will, your friend's question just proves the point. You have to be careful preaching God's grace because people will think they can abuse it. They'll think they can just do whatever they want. And Paul He hears this charge against him and he doubles down again and again and again. And this is the theme of Galatians over and over again. He says, once again, we're saved by our faith, not by our performance. See, it's Jesus plus nothing. And each paragraph of this letter of Galatians, Paul is driving this point deeper and deeper and deeper. See, the religious leaders, they were accusing Paul of preaching a new message. Paul, we've always taught that you're acceptable to God through obedience to the laws of Moses. And Paul, it's dangerous for you to tell them otherwise. They might, they, might, they might just think they can abandon the laws of Moses altogether. And Paul says, no, 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 no. We are saved by our faith in Jesus, not our obedience to religious rules. And this is the case Paul is trying to make. And he makes his case in two ways. And and I want you to stay with me because here's what's going to happen over about the next 10, 12 minutes. We're going to do some Old Testament theology, okay? And But you sat through a four-hour football game last night. You can sit through 15 minutes of Bible, okay? Galatians chapter 3. But we're going to work through Galatians 3 and build the case that our salvation was always by faith, never our performance, and then we're going to get back to my fraternity brother's question from 20 years ago. And what Paul says is this, is these people were saying, ah, Paul, you're preaching something new. And Paul says, the promise of salvation, the promise of God was always this way. What I'm preaching is nothing new. I'm preaching the same thing that has been in the scriptures since the beginning. And he, in verse 6, he says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, that word righteousness simply means he was considered right before God, meaning Abraham was accepted by God. He was, sins were forgiven. He was accepted by God, not because of his moral performance. Abraham was not saved because he was an awesome guy. He was saved because of his faith. It says right here, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. His righteousness, meaning his right standing before God, came through his faith, not his performance. And Paul says, verse 7, he says, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, 
saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Now, Paul is like a trial lawyer. He's brilliant here, okay? He, he takes the argument straight to Abraham. So these were Jewish background Christians that were throwing these charges against Paul, saying, Paul, you're preaching something new. And you're preaching something new. And Paul goes right back to Abraham, and it's important because they were saying, uh, uh, these, these religious leaders were telling the Galatian Christians that they were second-class Christians because they weren't obeying the laws of Moses in the way they thought they should. And they said, if you want to receive the blessing of Abraham, you better obey all these laws. And Paul says, that doesn't make any sense because Abraham was not accepted before God because he obeyed a bunch of laws. He was accepted before God because of his faith. And if you want to receive the same blessing as Abraham, you receive it the same way Abraham received it, which is by grace through faith. In what? The Messiah, who's Jesus. See, this is where we're, we're going to do some theology here. See, many people think that the Bible is to be split up into two books. There's the Old Testament, and then there's the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, people were saved by obeying all these laws, and they're purifying themselves and cleansing themselves, and they, their sins were forgiven by, um, uh, by making sacri animal sacrifices and all these sort of things. And so the belief is that many people have is that people in the Old Testament were saved by works of the law, but in the New Testament, Jesus shows up on the scene, and now it's different, and now we're saved by grace. But Paul says, no, that's not true at all. Paul says that salvation has always come the same way. We've always been saved through faith in the Messiah. Old Testament people, meaning Abraham and others, they were saved by believing in faith that God would send a Messiah. New Testament people, meaning us, we're saved by believing in the Messiah who has come. See, Jesus is the center of history. <laughs> those before him looked ahead to him, and those of us after him look back to him. Jesus has always been the focal point of our faith. What the Old Testament people saw dimly, we see clearly, but salvation has always been found in faith in the promise that God would send a Messiah who would die for the sins of the world. Now skip down in verse 13. It says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So Paul says here, he's going back to faith. You are saved by faith. And what Paul is saying is there is no one who has ever walked this earth apart from Jesus that can stand before God and point to their own goodness as the reason they should be accepted by God. Why? Because no one has been good enough. But we, can't, we cannot point to our own goodness, but we can point to Jesus' goodness. Paul says, because it was Jesus who is sinless, perfectly righteous and acceptable for God. Jesus perfectly obeyed all the laws of Moses. Jesus perfectly did everything that was asked of him. And he stood before the Father and he said, I am righteous, I've done it right. He said, but I, want, I am innocent, but will you take the sins of the guilty and place them on me? I will become a curse for them so that they can be redeemed from the curse. And even though Jesus lived a perfect life, he died the death we deserve. He became a curse for us so that he could redeem us from the curse. This is how we are accepted by God, yesterday, today, and forever, through faith in what Jesus has done for us. And the religious leaders, and Paul is saying, he's like, it's always been this way. Abraham's, so Abraham's righteousness was because he had faith in the Messiah who was to come. And see, the religious leaders, they accused Paul. They said, Paul, you're bringing a new message. We've always followed the law for our acceptance. That's what our scriptures teach. And Paul says to them, it seems to me that you've read your scriptures wrong. He says, salvation comes through faith in Jesus. This isn't a new message. This has always been the plan. And then Paul makes a second point. He says, it's important for you guys to know, he said, that the laws of Moses came after Abraham, the law came after the promise. Paul say, uh, says in verse 15, he says, to you give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. And this, he says, this is what I mean. 
The law, which came 430 years afterward, after Abraham, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So what Paul is saying here is he says the promise of salvation was always through faith in a Messiah. Always was. And when God makes a promise, there will never be amendments to it. God's promises never change. They cannot be annulled or ratified. Think of when you were a kid and one of your friends made a promise, right? And you're like, hey, pinky promise, no take backs, triple stamp, no erases, can't triple stamp a double stamp. My millennials got that. All right, my people. But you can't break a promise, right? Like uh, you can, a promise is a promise. You can't, uh, you can't annul it. You can't ratify. You can't make amendments to it. And this is what Paul is saying. He's saying when, G, when God promises something, he doesn't make amendments to it. He means what he says. And Paul's point is God made a promise to Abraham of how salvation would come through faith in him. He says, then the law came 430 years after that, which means that our salvation never was contingent upon the law. The law came well after the promise of salvation which means the law was never the means by which we were saved. Therefore, Paul is making the point. He's saying, therefore, there must be another reason for the law. See, I know we've been delving into some Old Testament stuff here, but don't lose me. Paul's making this point. Our acceptance before God, meaning his love for us, has never been contingent upon how good or obedient we are or even how hard we try or even how well-intentioned we are. The commands that God has given us are not prerequisites to receive his love because they came after the promise of his love. But that still begs the question, and Paul is about to ask it, and it's this, verse 19. So why then the law? What's the point of it? And Paul says, it was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary applies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would be by the law. But the scriptures imprison everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, there's a lot there. Long story, really short. One of the purposes of the law, one of the great and primary purposes of the law, Paul says, the Ten Commandments and all the rest of it, is to show us that we are incapable of living up to God's standards. There is not one person in this room, there's not one person in human history who has obeyed the Ten Commandments, much less the 613 other laws, to a T. And the point then reveals to us that we need a Savior. One of the primary purposes of the law is to reveal to us that we cannot obey God perfectly. Therefore, we need someone who can. We need a Savior. See, the first purpose for the law for all the commands of the Bible is to reveal our need for Jesus. When we come, and when we come to Jesus in faith saying, I can't live up to the standards you've laid out, but Jesus has, and I'm placing all my faith in him. And the scriptures say that it's then when we experience the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy of Jesus. And Paul goes on to say in verse, 14, in verse 24 on, he said, when we come to Jesus in faith, he also, God adopts us as sons, and this is where transformation begins. Paul says in verse 24, So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So here's what I want everybody to do. I know we've been, we just spent 10 minutes or so going deep to Old Testament. I want everybody to shake it out, okay? We did it. All of this begs the question. Why do we obey the commands of the Bible? Now we're back to the front steps of the fraternity house asking the question. If our actions, if our good deeds, if our good works, if our good intentions don't make us any more or less acceptable to God, 
If God is a God of grace, if God's love is unconditional, if the way uh, to God is Jesus plus nothing, then what's the point of the commands? Can I just keep doing whatever I, I want to keep doing? And here's the thing. That's a fair question. It's actually a good question. But what I need you to see today is this. God's commands are for our benefit. They're for our good and for our joy. Yes, Sometimes God's commands are confusing. We don't understand why he commands the things he commands. We don't understand why he says this this is right and this is wrong sometimes. Sometimes we're like, these are just too hard. It's too hard to obey these things. Or sometimes they don't feel natural to us. Sometimes they feel restrictive. Sometimes they seem difficult. But here's the thing. You cannot dismiss out of hand the commands of Jesus. You must learn to trust them. Paul says that through faith we have been made sons of God And therefore, we are to obey the commands of God as a child obeys the commands of a loving parent. And this is the first thing I want you to see. Why do we obey? Number one, the commands show us the best possible way to live. So I remember the precise moment, like the exact moment when I realized that my parents were right all along. All right? For years, okay? I thought that all the chores my parents made me do, all the rules they made me follow, I thought they were silly. I thought they were arbitrary. I thought they were there just to keep me busy so that my parents could feel some sense of control, right? And the one that always, I I never understood it, it always bugged me, is that my mom was always on my case about hanging my towel up in the bathroom. She said, Will, quit throwing your towel on the floor. Pick your towel up, hang your towel up. And I'm like, mom, what's the big deal? I'm showering again tomorrow. I'll just pick it up off the floor and dry myself off then. I don't understand. What's the big deal? Well, then I went off to college. Finally, I was free. Free from the burdens of the restrictions of my parents, all their just needless rules. And I thought, I am free to live however I want to live. Well, then one day, I'm sitting in class. And I notice that something smells awful. And so I kind of lean to the left. I smell the person next to me. I lean to my right, smell the person next to me. And then I kind of lean ahead. I'm smelling people in front of me. I'm like, it's not them. And then I'm like, it's me. It's me. See what had happened. I went off to college and I was free to live by my own rules. And so I would shower and I would throw that towel in the bottom of my damp, dirty closet and I'd pick it up again the next day. I learned about a little thing called mildew. And when you start washing yourself with a towel that has been mildewed, you begin to smell disgusting, right? And I learned in that moment that my mother's commands were not there to restrict me They weren't there to just keep me busy. They weren't needless rules, but rather she was she was trying to instill in me the habit of hanging up my towel because she didn't want me to be the smelly guy who couldn't get a date. All right. Listen, this is the commands of God like this. Listen, we often think that God's commands are arbitrary, that they're restrictive. But Jesus says, I've come so that you may have life and have it abundantly. Every single thing that Jesus commands you to do in the Bible is Jesus' way of telling you, here's how you can live your best life. I want what is best for you. So when you see a command in the scriptures, even if it doesn't make sense to you, even if it seems unnatural to you, even if it seems frustrating to you, things like flee sexual immorality. You're like, I don't want to. Things like turn the other cheek. You're like, that doesn't sound fun. I'll get taken advantage of. Things like love your neighbor as yourself or do not covet or forgive your enemies or honor your father and mother or be generous and lend freely. None of those things feel natural, but they will most certainly lead you into a better life if you walk in those things. See, sometimes we obey the commands of Jesus simply because we trust that Jesus has our best interest in mind. I have come, he says, so that you may have life and have it to the fullest. See, the commands of God show us the best possible way to live. But the second thing is this. The commands of God limit 
the damage of our sin. Uh, Jesus' uh, brother James says in James chapter 1, verse 14, he says, Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So what James is saying here is there's a progression to sin. What often starts as a temptation, run, it, it begin, becomes a desire, which becomes uh, rationalizing. Uh, I, you know, I, just this once, or no one will ever know, or uh, I, I deserve this, I need to blow off some steam. The rationalization, the minimum, it, it, it gives birth to sin, and sin, once you've gotten hold of it, it begins to run its course, and it brings destruction every time. See, sin will position itself as something attractive. It'll position itself like it's something that's not that big of a deal. But then it turns on us the moment that we grasp at it. The very second we take the bait, it sets the hook. And I, I, one, I remember many years ago, in my early years as a pastor... I remember uh, at the church I was serving at the time during the time of response, during that last song after the message, I watched as a 15-year-old girl comes down the aisle and gets down at the altar and just lays herself down at the altar. And I watched as she just begins sobbing. And and I'll never forget the image of, of just her shoulders just shaking violently as she weeps at this altar. And I was a you know, pastor in the church, so I knew the situation. And this teenage girl, just a day earlier, had discovered her father's secret sin. It had been exposed, and it crushed her. Absolutely crushed her. And I remember just taking in that scene of this devastated little girl. And I remember going home that afternoon, and I'm not a journaler. I wish I was better at it. So you people who are disciplined to journal every day, I wish I could do it. But I, I've dusted off my journal. I found it. And I just sat down and I wrote out in as vivid of detail as I could describe what I saw that morning with that girl. Now, why did I do that? Because I wanted to capture what I saw so that I would never forget it. And, and I remember just writing in my journal, uh, what I saw, I saw this girl shaking and sobbing. And, and, and I just remember saying to myself, and I wrote in my journal, sin is never worth it. It's never worth it. And at that time, I didn't have little girls, but now I do. And the thought of seeing my girls at the altar sobbing over my sin haunts me. And it's something that actually inspires me, motivates me to honor the way of Jesus, even when I don't feel like it. Because sin damages. And we obey the commands of Jesus because it limits the damage of our sin. See, many of us, we think so selfishly. We think of God's commands as restrictions on us. As if God's commands just keep us from having fun. But what I want you to see is that God's commands are are gracious invitations from God on how we can honor Him, love Him, know Him, and love those around us and live the most abundant life possible. Listen, if your sin goes unchecked, not only will it destroy your life, but it will destroy the lives of others around you. And so we obey the commands of Jesus to limit the damage of our own sin. King David I I never understood this, but King David, he'll write psalms talking about how he delights in the law of the Lord. He's like, man, I just day and night meditate on the laws of the Lord. I'm like, who stays up at night and like meditates on rules? You know, (laughs) that's never been me. But David understood something that I think we need to understand. And that is that the laws of the Lord are invitations into the fullness of life. And they are things that protect us from the worst that is in us. Listen, if you believe the gospel, that God loves you so much that he would die for you, that he would give his son for you, then you must trust that his commands are not there to keep you from having fun. They are there to lead you into the most abundant life. And they're there to protect you. See, we don't earn... It's Jesus plus nothing. Listen, we don't obey the commands of God in order to gain God's acceptance. 
We obey the commands of God because we know that we're already loved and accepted in Christ. But because we've been loved and accepted, we believe, we, we, we assume His commands must be for our good. See, obedience to the law has always been a response to God's love for us, not a precondition for it. Think of the Ten Commandments. Do you know how they start? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Therefore, commandment number one, have no other gods before me. See, the commands of God always follow the faithfulness of God. Why do we obey? Because God has first been good to us. John Bunyan, 17th century Baptist preacher, and that was 17th century back when being a Baptist was cool, like being a rebel. You know what I mean? Now we're not so cool, but they were cool back then. And uh, uh, John Bunyan, he wrote uh, Pilgrim's Progress. If you've ever read that book, it's just an incredible book. But Bunyan, John Bunyan, he was go- traveling all over the world preaching the good news of the gospel. And similar to Paul, some of the religious authorities of his day got frustrated with the message he was preaching. He was preaching the message of God's grace. And they said, Mr. Bunyan, if you keep preaching free salvation in Jesus based on his performance and not on theirs, then Christians might do whatever they want. And John Bunyan responded, No, if I keep preaching free salvation in Jesus based on his performance and not on theirs, Christians are going to do whatever he wants. See, if you've been transformed by the power of the gospel, the logical response of your life would be to obey what God has given you. See, we obey out of a love for God, not in order to be loved by God. So back to my buddy's question. Can we just keep doing whatever we want and rely on God's forgiveness to keep forgiving us? I've thought about that question for 20 years. Can we just keep doing whatever we want and just bank on God forgiving us over and over and over again? Here's my answer to that question. I suppose you could, but why would you? Listen, we don't get into heaven by our obedience to the commands. But we can experience some of the joys of heaven here and now by walking in the way that Jesus has carved out for us. And we can avoid many of the pains of hell here and now by walking in the way that Jesus has laid out for us. He is good. He is trustworthy. That's why we obey. Not in order to gain his approval, but because we've already been given it. And we believe that he is the path to abundant life. Wide is the way, and many are on it, that leads to destruction. But narrow is the path that leads to eternal life. It's an honor to be your pastor, Calvary. Let me pray for you. God, I am once again overwhelmed by the goodness of the gospel that you would look on us aimless, wandering, lost, just repeating the same mistakes and sins over and over and over again, destined to live a life far from you. But in love, you sent forth your Son to live the life we could never live, to obey the commands we never could obey in the first place and to die the death that we deserve in our place. He became a curse for us so that we could be redeemed from the curse of the law. And God, I pray that as we receive that, that we don't receive your grace as something to be abused. Paul will go on to say, may we, should we sin so that grace may abound? May it never be. God, may we, may we learn to love your commands. Not because in them we think that we're earning anything, but because in them we know that we are finding our way closer and closer to you and your plan for our lives and your, the goodness you have marked out for us. God, we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Church, would you stand? We're going to sing one more song, and I invite you to respond however the Spirit leads as we sing.